in those sets, I feel like I'm there and I'm in that time. You know, you're just transported to that world. Basically, if you think about it, we're time traveling. As far as Chris and his department, we leave them completely alone. And then we walk into these incredible sets. With the Duffers, we started on a very similar page, and they trust me to know kind of my end of things in terms of how do we execute making this physical. You know, we want the show to always feel grounded to an extent. That's the tone of the movies that we grew up that we love, that there was a realness and a grittiness to them, but also, you know, they find a pirate ship. We discussed all of the classics that are very obvious, you know, your Goonies and your Spielberg films. It's so good at doing what I loved watching as a kid, movies about kids on bikes on an adventure. And then it got really exciting for me when we started talking about Clute, Silkwood, these other darker, little grittier American movies. It's dark, it's stormy, you know, it's uh, creepy. Which is the double-edged quality that we want all things to be on Stranger Things, cool and creepy. They basically create these great stories on the page and they're kind of like, how do you think this character's home should look? How should this laboratory look? What makes sense for Hawkins, Indiana, 1983? Season two was always gonna start at an arcade and that arcade was gonna be filled with the Duffer Brothers' favorite video games. There were actual functioning video games everywhere and that you could go and you could play them. Season one, we're a little more Stand By Me and E.T. Season two, we head a little bit more into the James Cameron world. From the very beginning of season two, we were discussing the shadow monster and all of these sort of big supernatural elements. It definitely got bigger as a little more spectacle. The danger got a little bit broader and scarier. We knew our biggest hurdle over the course of the season was going to be the uh, tunnel systems. The tunnels were really exciting season two because it was something wholly new, you know, it was sort of this, essentially the upside down infecting our world physically. Whenever we have a very complicated sequence, Michael storyboards it, and he's kind of our secret weapon. They all were on the same page. They wanted something that was growing and organic feeling and kind of mysterious. And of course it's the upside down, so it has to be scary. It was daunting. It was not like anything we had designed or built on our show. It started with plywood rings and we'd wrap back around with essentially chicken wire and then we uh, used a three pound foam throughout the entire interior surface to give us that more organic shape and scenics would come back in to make it look freaky. It looked real. It looked like a really nasty upside down. We ended up filling a massive warehouse full of tunnels. <laughs> you know, it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. You know, I defer to the script, ultimately, and I find so much of the inspiration for what we're doing is just there on the page. Chris is able to really pinpoint what the brothers are imagining or envisioning when they're writing. It's all collaborative. They found these neighborhoods that seem completely unchanged from the 80s. And then Chris takes those houses, uses them for inspiration, and then builds these incredible sets. A big part of the initial process is location scouting. We've got a really fantastic location department here. Literally every department here is essential to bringing that tone to its right spot. It's the same with the lighting and, I mean, the editing and everything. So you have to you have a certain obsessiveness every step of the way. But to create an authentic period world requires thousands of specific decisions. That sheet, that cassette tape on that bedroom dresser. And that's when it gets really kind of nitty gritty with references and with drawings. And we start to, I, you know, I get together with my set decorator and we talk about, you know, wallpaper and floor finishes and paint colors. And, you know, so this, it's a really elaborate process from start to finish. And it just involves so many people. Jess has been with me really in the trenches. I mean, she'll spend her weekends at estate sales to make sure that we have the life layers that we need for our sets. So you're looking for like old newspapers and packaging and paper cups and cans and things that are old. Call I keep a Sears catalog on my desk for whatever year we're shooting in and I've referenced it, it's like a Bible. But the beauty is that you can point the camera anywhere and it's these sets and these houses are filled with just the most incredible, specific little objects, anything, and it's all based on character. The goal is that when the actors come in and they walk into the environment, they feel completely transported. And when you get on set, it's, you feel like you're in the 80s, like, especially in the basement. The first time the boys were together, acting together, and they spent you know the better part of a shooting day in the basement, 
a few hours later, I walked on set and one of them, I think it might've been Caleb, was like, oh wow, I totally forgot that we were on a set. You know, it made me feel like we'd done our job. Mom, we're in the middle of a campaign. I think the most important part of the process is understanding who the characters are. The stories are so foolproof and really well put together that, you know, it gives us a really good palette to start building our world off of. We have a story that we want to tell and we're making sure that everything is in service of the story. You hire people who know more about that area and are more talented in that department than you are, and then you let them do their thing. <laughs>